Yo, what up, what up, what up, and welcome back, man. Listen, all right, this is part two of motherfucking us breaking down agriculture after globalization. And I'm with Peter Z. Hand giving a lecture. Legit. Doku's with me. Doku, are you enjoying this, man? Like, yo, because I love fucking this dude. This dude's fucking awesome to me. Oh, no, like I said, I... I haven't listened to this guy in detail before. He's on point. He skips a few things that I think are important. But for the most part, yeah, he's pretty spot on, man. I, yeah, I like this dude a lot. Legit. You know what I'm saying? Like, fucking, I've been, like, I actually bought his books. You know, all three of them. <laughs> like, legit. You know what I mean? Like, fucking, just because I wanted to hear exactly what he was saying. And, like, you know, it's, it's, it's not bad. My question is, is Biden with him trying to bring globalization back online? You know, I mean, whether this is going to happen. So we'll see. We'll see where the hell we're at. You know, I mean, I think after after Biden's I don't th I think Biden's one term as well. You know, I mean, we're going to swing back again and end up having more of a populist candidate who's going to leave the world order as a whole. So let's you know, I mean, let's keep rocking. You know, I mean, we're at 35 minutes out of an hour and 25 on this fucking video. Let's keep banging. <laughs> major exporters of grain and soy. They're the blues and the deep greens. They're the major exporters and suppliers to the world. Everyone else is a net importer. And any country that is in yellow, I'm sorry, any country that is in red or orange imports at least half of the calories that they need to survive. In the world that we're going to, with supply chains breaking down, these are the countries that are looking at at least a 40% reduction in their capacity to grow the crops in the first place. That even assumes there's no distribution problem. We have a word for this. Famine. Deep. Continental in scope. But you'll notice that America doesn't have an X on it. It's one of very few producers that can actually maintain output in this environment. In fact, there aren't very many. This is just simply a grill, grid cell showing uh, where the where lands are under crop. Uh, there are only a few places that have the right mix of low production costs, local or regional sources of inputs, and stable long-term financial status that will enable them to be long-term producers. The first, of course, is the United States. After that, you've got France and Argentina, kind of smaller versions of the United States, similar structures in terms of supporting their agricultural systems. And you've got Myanmar, that's purely a rice play and you don't care, so moving on. Australia, uh, the problem the Australians have isn't in terms of supply, it's climatic. They have very, very wet years, they've got very, very dry years, they get very, very hot years, and it's erratic. So they are a large producer, they are an increasing producer, but they are not a stable producer. But the one that you guys really care about is this one, New Zealand. Outside of these six locations, everyone is going to have to reduce their monoculture and specialization just in an attempt to feed their own populations. So we are looking at catastrophic collapses in the world's ability to feed itself. That's the long term. Let's talk about the short term. Let's talk about your primary competition in the world to come, and that is absolutely New Zealand. Now, I was fortunate enough to go to university in New Zealand. This is a picture of my feet uh, above Lake Wanaka. Uh, I lived there for a year. I've been back a couple of times, most recently last February. And while I was hiking around last time, I ran across these guys at 8,000 feet. And so I went to a different island and I found these guys uh, on a hillside that you know you, you probably wouldn't graze on here in the United States. Getting a little tired of cows at this point, so I went to a national park, but I found out that they were there too. And then I decided to go to a beach resort, and they were there as well. <sighs> Key thing to remember about New Zealand, it gets a lot of rain, but it's a marine climate everywhere. So their summers are cool, their winters are warm. The cows don't have to be in enclosures. They're just brought in when it's milking time. Almost all of their food is grazing. And so we have seen the dairy herd more than double over the last 30 years and dairy output from New Zealand more than triple. And there's no reason to expect that to change. Well, maybe there's one. Whoops, sorry, I had a couple more slides. <laughs> uh, 
the white is what you care about here. I'm sorry, the, uh, the black is what you care about here. That is the dairy herd as it was uh, about 25 years ago. Here's where it is as of five years ago, the most recent data I've been able to access. Uh, it's every region is seeing more and more dairy. One of the outcomes of what it appears to be climate change is that New Zealand is warming. So areas that used to be too cold are suddenly not. And we're seeing dairy cows throughout the entire country. Now there is one little bit of hope for you in terms of constraining the growth path. And that's this gentleman. This is Winston Peters. He's the leaders of a nationalist populist group in New Zealand called New Zealand First. And he has kind of been uh, the kingmaker in Kiwi politics now for almost 30 years. He's been in almost every single government as a deputy prime minister. And he largely represents the native population, the Maori, as well as rural voters. And he has single handedly prevented any sort of meaningful restrictions on rural development, particularly as comes to dairy. So think of the, some of the basic things that you, got, you guys do with waste disposal in your enclosures. The Kiwi dairies don't need to do that. And not just because they don't have enclosures, because there's no regulation on it. So they forage wherever they want to go, the cows do their thing, and then it's just left. Summer is cool, winter is warm, the herd is range fed, costs are low, regulations are non-existent. But Winston Peters' party was wiped out in the October elections a couple months ago. They lost every single seat. And for the first time in 30 years, Winston Peters is not deputy prime minister. So now the Kiwis have a labor majority government that is supported by the Greens. So more regulation, or more honestly, um, just regulation, is coming. And that will constrain where and how cows can forage and what sort of access farmers have to national lands and what they have to do with their waste in terms of water quality. That will slow things down. But honestly, that's the only tiny bit of good news I have for you as regards potential limitations on New Zealand dairy output. Okay, like let's, let's uh, I have no idea what to say about this. Do you have anything to say about this, Doku? Uh, the only thing I have to say about this one is for New Zealand, you guys are making a mistake by trying to put regulations in place when you already have uh, a rather effective dairy farm, uh, a dairy export uh, with the way things are going. Knowing that, as, as was already said, the rest of the world can't feed itself, that puts you in a very advantageous position. Yeah, I don't, I don't know, I don't know anything about Kiwi politics. To be honest with you, I don't pay attention to New Zealanders, like just because I don't fucking care. You know, I mean, I only know, <laughs> I only know a bit because of the ones that I've talked to through uh, Discord and Line Chat, mostly Line Chat. And again, they're they're kind of like the uh, the Melbourne uh, Alexandria style, like Australians. I believe it's Alexandria, New Alexandria, whatever the hell they call it, doesn't matter. Where you know, oh, cows allowing to graze everywhere is bad because of global warming. It's like, no, you guys are in an advantageous position where not only can you provide food, you can actually export it for profit. Why you would want to to undermine or hinder that process is beyond me, but that's about all I have to say on it. Because, so, because white people are fucking dumb, that's why. Because... White people are fucking yep. stupid. That that's the reason why they're fucking retarded. I don't I don't know why, legit. Like yo, he's a native nativist dude. You know what I'm saying? Like all the natives vote for him, and the rural people do. But the city folk are fucking dumb as shit. You know, I mean, college educated idiots are fucking idiots, and they don't understand where their food comes from. But let's keep going because this is um this is like his shit about agriculture. You know, this is um like his uh, he's fucking talking to a dairy people dairy west which I guess is a giant dairy cooperative or something along these type of lines or a dairy uh, lobbyist company. I don't know. You know what I mean? But we're going to keep banging. You know what I'm saying? We're going to, we're going to keep, yes, he's a dairy yep. west in the middle. <laughs> Let's keep going. <laughs> Thank you. I have for you as regards potential limitations on New Zealand dairy output. The real challenge for you guys is that they're already big and they're getting better. First, Powdered milk can only take you so far. Now, I realize that 99% of the liquid milk that's produced in the United States is consumed locally uh, because it, it perishes. But look at that Tetra Pak on the left. 
the Kiwis are now exporting upwards of 15% of the dairy output this way. It can be done. Yes, it's a different cost point. Yes, it's a different product, but powdered milk can only take you so far. Second, you have to be able to provide value add. Now, one of the things that the Kiwis do is local dairies partner with local creameries. They get a lot of support from their national dairy conglomerate, Frontero, which is a, uh, a state sponsored entity. But to give you an idea, now that cheese board there, that's something called Kapiti Kikorangi. It is a local cheese that kind of combines a semi-firm brie with blue cheese. It is bar none, the most glorious thing I have ever put in my mouth. And every time I go to New Zealand now, I gain at least 10 pounds in the first week. And they have dozens of varieties like this. What they have managed to achieve is American scale and American quality with French differentiation and product variety. And barring some significant shift in the American dairy sector, you guys are never gonna be able to compete with the Kiwis on price, product, quality, or variety. So it's time to start trying. Because otherwise, any market where you come up against the Kiwis head to head, you are going to lose. Barring that, your only hope is that the Kiwis will limit their own production. Now, keep in mind, the Kiwis are a small country in the middle of an ocean, very isolated, largely immune to the geopolitical threats that are coming. So we've got to play that against the broader trade relationships that the Americans are going to have. And on that, the news is decent. There are five deals that the Trump administration has been working on or is finished. And there's a lot of things we can say about the Trump administration being you know, behind the times or not being very detail oriented or pissing off the wrong people. But on trade, I think the Trump administration has broadly gotten it right. Now, Korea, Japan, Canada, the United Kingdom, those four countries have no choice. South Korea doesn't exist without American security overwatch. Canada can't pivot. The United Kingdom has destroyed its links to the European Union, so it's a deal on Washington's terms or a depression. And it's seared into Japan's collective memory that you do not piss off the United States. Of the five countries in play, only one, Mexico, has things that the United States wants. A complementary economic system a growing market, a young demographic. And so of these five deals, we really only had to negotiate with Mexico. Everyone else, it was take it or leave it terms. And with the exception of the United Kingdom deal, which is in negotiation right now, all the others of these aren't simply done. They're not simply ratified. They've already been implemented. The hard work here for the world we're going into has already been done by the Trump administration. There's one piece, and honestly for you guys, it's probably the most important one that still needs to be worked out, and that's with the United Kingdom. Right now, as we are staring at our screens, Boris Johnson, the British Prime Minister, and Ursula van der Leyen, the European Commission President, are having dinner trying to figure out if they can have a Brexit deal. There's probably not going to be one. In fact, without the direct forceful intervention of German Chancellor Angela Merkel, there's probably not going to be a deal at all which means that the Brits are almost certain to have a hard crash out of the European Union on December 31. So what does that mean to you? You gotta look at how, what the Brits eat. I'm sure this isn't a surprise, but British food is awful. Now we eat more meat and veggies per person than the Brits. They eat more potatoes and wheat. We eat more cheese and drink more milk. They use more cream and powdered. Buttered is about similar. But the bottom line is the UK imports about one third of their foodstuffs, the majority of which comes from the European Union itself. That's gonna disappear. Over half of what they produce can only be produced because of European Union subsidies. It's high cost, it's utterly awful quality. So we are looking at two thirds of the United Kingdom's food intake facing some degree of adjustment. That should be your biggest takeaway today. In American British trade talks, US ag is going to get access to 66 million first world customers and is likely to end up providing at least one third of their food. That will be the single biggest expansion in US agricultural exports in history. So 
that's the biggest new market that you are about to gain. Let's talk about the biggest current. Man, what do you think, my brother? Doku. All right. All right. So, so he was correct. At first, I was about to say, oh, dude, you're wrong. But with, well, with how he ended, now he's 100% correct. Because, yeah, sure, there, there was a deal, as we know. It, obviously, for anybody listening, this, this video is after the, the Brexit deal came, came to fruition. And a big part of the reason that that deal was even possible is because that the UK, by decoupling itself from the EU, opens itself up to new markets, specifically the United States, uh, United States, which is a net exporter of agricultural goods. The UK never needed the EU, and which, as he said in the the end of that segment, yeah, sure, well, <laughs> we'll just make a deal with the US. Uh, uh, we already we're already a net exporter to China, and we still have a surplus. And we throw out we throw out milk all the damn time. Uh, we can't eat the amount of food that we produce. Who who thinks that we're not going to export it to someone like the UK? It, which is exactly what he said. It, so no, he's one hundred percent on point. He's not wrong in any way, shape, or form. It it's not going to be. It's not going to be something that pleases the markets as they have been established over the past couple of decades because, you know, the money is there. It's it is the status quo. They don't like they don't like when the status quo gets upset. But that said, we we have the better deal. And the UK took advantage of it, as we saw. So, no, he's 100 percent correct. Yeah, I know. (laughs) <laughs> like yo like legit like you know like fucking um when they came to us about this brexit shit we said look we want two things one is um that financial center you have in london yeah that's coming to new york um and the second part is those two new aircraft carriers you're gonna motherfucking uh you're gonna be you're building or whatever and this was like three or four years ago and like now they're online he said uh yeah those are part of the united states battle group now and that actually happened yeah, no, I mean that exactly. It was a mutually beneficial thing. We we can provide you with food. You won't have to be reliant upon the EU anymore. And in exchange, all we want is preferential trade agreements and uh, you know come into our military fold uh, when we ask for help. And throw us a bone. That's really all we need. That's all we want. Yep, it's that simple. All right, let's keep rocking that you are about to gain. Let's talk about the biggest current market that you are about to lose. Let's talk about China. The US Navy is 10 times as powerful as everybody else has put together. And that's one of the reasons why globalization works. The US Navy is omnipresent on the high seas. But remove that and the security that is necessary for large scale civilian shipping goes away. I'm sure a lot of you have heard the scuttlebutt that the Chinese have even a bigger navy in terms of ships in the United States. This is the Shandong. This is their new aircraft carrier. And in terms of number of ships, that is true. But to be perfectly honest, sometimes it is about size. Most Chinese vessels are tiny. So the Shandong here, the U.S. has 10 carriers that size. They're the core of our marine expeditionary units. In addition, the United States has 11 super carriers each of which independently has at least five times the capacity of the Shandong. I mean, there's no competition here. So the Chinese might be able to control the seas within a couple hundred miles of their coast, but that's it. Because 90% of their vessels can't sail more than a thousand miles from home. So from a security point of view, it's laughable to think that the Chinese could maintain a regional trade order, much less a global trade order, much less displace the United States. This is not on the cards. But then there's demographics. The Chinese have gone through the same problems that everybody else in the world has. Here's a demographic profile back in 1980. Lots and lots of young people. This is one of the reasons why Mao put in the one-child policy. You fast forward to the year 2000, and they're in that magical moment 
lots of consumption led, lots of young labor can export, but a few things are in the process of evolving. First, all those young people have now aged. So the consumption led low production period is over. Second, all those young adults didn't have very many kids because of one child. Now in the short term, that actually helps the numbers because if you're spending money on things like condos and pizza and vacations, that generates a lot more follow on growth than doing it on diapers and milk. But 20 years later, you're no longer in your 20s and your 30s, you're in your 40s and your 50s and there are no kids coming up to replace you and the consumption pulse that you see collapses. And then third, China cannibalized the countryside to fuel urban activity. You can only do that until you run out of people. Now in the United States, the urbanization process was slow. It took two centuries. The Chinese did it in 35 years. So that process does generate amazing levels of growth and that's what we know as the panda boom but it's a moment in time and you can only do it once and it's over and here's where the chinese demography is today china has not simply aged out of its demographic moment it has aged past the point of any even theoretical demographic recovery so <laughs> Everybody that's concerned about China, what do you think about this right here, my friends? Legit. <laughs> Yo, Doku, you, you seeing what I'm seeing? Yeah, no, there. This this is one to break down. So, where where do I begin? I'm gonna put the military viability aside. The economic viability of China. And this will explain to, to everybody listening why China is so incredibly aggressive in terms of their, not their localized economy, but the way that they do business with the rest of the world is because even with their shrinking demographics, China cannot support its own growth because it exploded so incredibly quickly. It, the only way that the Chinese economy is sustainable, like, let's forget growing past what it is right now but maintaining some degree of stability will only happen as long as china maintains the level of export producer power dominance that they have as we've seen over the past roughly decade decade and a half which they're starting to lose despite what you know the chinese uh communist party would tell you they are starting to lose that advantage which is also the reason that you see them building artificial reefs and you know trying to tighten down and crack down on trade routes and bully you know areas like japan australia and south korea because they are losing that advantage that they've had because they're they're suffering the same problem that their population growth in the case of the united states there's not enough population growth to keep up the consumer farce that we've had. But in the case of China, there's not enough population growth to continue to produce the same level at such cheap levels that it makes them economically competitive. It, they really are a yin and a yang compared to the Western consumer world and the Eastern producer world that China is arguably beyond a doubt, dominant. Hence why you see them desperately trying to expand their military. And yeah, of course, they want aircraft carriers or submarines to flex their muscles and say like, oh, look, we're just as viable as uh, the Russians, or uh, I believe they like to compare themselves to uh, Lin Yin, was the uh, Chinese sociologist. Uh, on irate prostate stream saying that they put out the exact tonnage of the entire French Navy once per year. That's fine and dandy. But you can't compete on the same level on a naval scale the way that the United States does. They only have two advantages. And those two advantages are very, very simple. And they took these from the USSR. 
they have a very advanced anti-ship missile system that is made specifically for trying to take out aircraft carriers. They're specifically hypersonic missiles. Obviously, we have weapon systems that are made to you know, put that shit dead in the dirt before it can do any real damage to us. The other thing they have is they have their naval submarine fleet, which is arguably the second most advanced in the world. Second only to the United States, of course. So China finds itself, uh, finds itself in a rather precarious situation. They require the United States and the rest of uh, the Western world to feed its population. They also require the United States to be a consumer. And they're also trying to compete with us on a naval scale. The only way they can do that is by intimidating us out of the South China Sea and the Sea of Japan. Which is not going to end well for them because Japan, South Korea, and Australia are going to, you know, not look too kindly on that. But we won't see this play out to its, uh, to its conclusion for several, several years, years until we'll see how good they actually are at producing navy, naval vessels and how good those missile systems actually are. But until then... They're still trapped. They're still strapped at the boot heel to us, because we feed them. They can produce all the technology they want. So unless they can circumvent the United States, and get our our political machine working in their favor, they're screwed. You're not that, wrong. That You're is, not wrong. That is the situation. We but have I also right now. I want to I want to add in there, like its navy is only meant to go to the first island chain, and let's let's be honest here. All right, the moment they get to Taiwan, <laughs> right, and Japan and South Korea, they have enough ground based fucking missile systems that they're just going to fire them into the goddamn dirt. And Japan has a deep sea navy that can just like go far enough out that you know i mean fucking china can't hit them but they'll be able to hit china all day long so understand like yo, china is not a threat and people need to stop worrying about it as such legitimately just because they have a billion people you know i mean and it's a communist country and everybody talks all this reckless maniacal bullshit about their you know i mean their abilities and all this type of stuff they really don't have that you know i mean like yo they're 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 a second-rate goddamn country at best. You know what I mean? But let's keep well, going. Let, let's let's keep banging on this video, and we'll go we'll go into some more shit here in a little bit. All right, make it up. Recovery, and it is hitting their economy at every level. Let's talk labor costs. Here's some average labor costs for some Southeast Asian nations that I think will actually do pretty well in the world to come. Here's Mexico, very competitive, right in the middle of the pack. And here's the PRC, 11-fold increase in labor prices in 20 years. It's the fastest labor inflation ever recorded anywhere in human history. Bottom line, China can no longer function as a low-cost or even a mid-cost manufacturing center. And they don't have the skill set to go higher. But it's also hitting consumption. This is new car sales. Now, when, when a country develops, there's certain things that everybody wants, and the order is the same everywhere. Number one, they want a cell phone. Number two, they want a refrigerator. Number three, they want a car. Well, I, I would argue to ignore that last bar in January of 2020, because in that month, China had their coronavirus lockdown, and I don't think anyone should be judged on their worst day. But look at the two years previous. China, supposedly this up-and-coming economy that's going to take over the world, can't even generate car sales while it's at its consumption peak. It's simple math. Most people for purchase their first car in their 20s, and China has 40% fewer 20-somethings than 30-somethings. The population is in a state of collapse. Bottom line, the sell-to-China play is nearly over just by the numbers. And that assumes nothing goes wrong with politics. Blaming others for coronavirus, punitive trade actions to punish political statements, being a general asshat in relations with everyone, 
the hateful propaganda that we have seen out of the PRC is not an accident. It isn't purely for the domestic audience. It is expressly designed to generate a backlash to help justify the CCP crackdown that is occurring at home and not just in Hong Kong and not just in Zhejiang. Now, strategically, the CCP has decided that part and parcel of this is that China will never again purchase any American foodstuffs unless there are no other options on the market. The Chinese market was never the promised land that many thought. It was always running on a sugar high. And now for political reasons in China, the market is closing until such time as China itself breaks. And you need to come to terms with that. This market is gonna be gone until the China that we've come to know is also gone. And I don't expect any significant shifts in policy on either side. Uh, first with the elections here in the United States, it became a contest over who could be more anti-Chinese. We have entered a sharply anti-Chinese phase politically, left, right, and center, that is going to run for years at the same time that the Chinese are experiencing system-breaking challenges. Second, there is zero hope for an improvement in relations. If anyone could theoretically steer the relationship in a more cooperative direction, it was former Iowa governor and former ambassador to China, Terry Branson. He's the guy toasting China in the bottom left there. He met Xi back in the 1980s, I think 1984, when Xi was on an agricultural exchange program that came to Iowa when Branson was a young governor. Uh, they hit it off, they became friends. Uh, Branson, of course, was governor of Iowa for like 175 terms, longest serving American governor in history. And eventually, when Trump became president, he tapped Branstead to be his representative in Beijing. And he did, in my opinion, an excellent job. But in the last three years, it's become obvious that the people who want a more cooperative relationship have been steadily sidelined on both sides. So Branstead tried to put together an op-ed to this point and publish it, and the Chinese immediately blacklisted him. And realizing there was nothing he could do, Branson resigned uh, back in October. Branson was Trump's only conduit to Xi. Everyone else has quit, fired, or been marginalized. And he's broadly representative of the status of the relationship in general. Those who want a good relationship have been shut out, and those who don't are the ones who are now in charge. Biden has not indicated at this point who his point man in China would be, but the folks on his national security team writ large have no meaningful specific expertise on the topic. So don't expect much. Third, despite China's official recovery from coronavirus, its economy is reeling. Remember, we've got lower global demand from the consuming economies. We've got retooling across the world as people try to bring manufacturing in-house. Their export orders have driven right up. So what growth we've seen has been mostly inventory builds. And that reminds me a lot of the lead up to the Asian financial crisis back in 1997. And we're just not gonna see a meaningful negotiation. The Chinese made Trump look the fool with the phase one stuff. They broke that, <laughs> they broke that deal the day after it was approved and they're now at roughly 25% of where they need to be in order to meet the supposed goals. And Biden's proclaimed policies suggest an even harder line for at least the first year. His whole Rebuild America, Buy America programs basically say that if there's a product out there that is made in the United States or abroad, the U.S. government will only purchase the locally made one. And if there is no locally made one, the U.S. will find some money to help build out the supply chains for building it here in the United States. And as anti-Chinese as that is, it's actually even worse. Now, what we've got here is a color-coded map showing. All right, my friend. Fucking like, yo, what do you think about that there? All right. So, again, he's not wrong, but this is something if, if you have, if you have a mind, if you have a mindset, if you have a memory that lasts longer than two years, uh, hopefully four years, but even longer than that, You'll recognize a simple fact. China 
much like the USSR back before the days of Gorbachev. And if you remember, uh, I believe it was the last stream, I mentioned a Chinese sociologist by the name of uh, Yi Li uh, saying that China would outpace the United States by the year 2027. Because as long as, in his words, as long as Chinese people eat, sleep, defecate, and work, uh, it will bring about the uh, death of the United States, specifically talking about the economic death of the United States. Well, here's the problem with that. China is a producer economy. You can produce as much as you want. Unless you have someone to buy your product. In this case, it would be the United States primarily, but also Europe, which is going through its own internal schism. China doesn't have any economic viability. The only viability they have is to continuous, uh, continuous expansion on a imperialistic scale, much like you would expect to see from Japan in the 1920s, 1930s, which is what you're actually seeing China do, except in this case, they're just building artificial islands as opposed to occupying islands that already exist. So he's not wrong in in his analysis of uh, the Chinese economic viability on a global scale. On a local scale, China chi China's China's been broken for a long time. They even with the one child policy, they still couldn't feed their population because of what he brought up, uh, the urbanization and the ur urban expansion specifically on the uh eastern and southern Chinese coast, where most of the rice fields, hey, go go look it up, there's some good videos on YouTube that describe the history of China going all the way back into the uh, 1800s about where the majority of Chinese agricultural productivity comes from. And if you look at those regions compared to where the majority of Chinese cities are now, it's, they're not producing agriculturally, they can't feed their own populations, their populations in the regions and those regions have grown and the water, the waterways in those areas, it, they're horribly polluted. You couldn't grow rice there if you wanted to. China is dependent upon the world to buy and consume its cheap products because it has such a high population. And this has been, this has been their economic policy going back to the 70s and the 80s. And they would argue that, oh, because of the coronavirus, specifically going back to Yi Li, that they think this is a godsend because they've they have managed to weather the storm. That's not true. It, they they will come out of this All right. worse off. Well, like let me let me say this right. First off, what he said about Biden, I don't believe at all. Right. I think Biden's America by American, whatever bullshit is a giant you know i mean eat a dick to the people right it's kind of like him like john mccain going all right you know what i'm saying like fuck those crazies back in arizona you know what i'm saying let me get back to you know i mean bombing brown people and fucking expanding the fucking state you know i mean i really don't think that biden is going to biden wants to go back to the old way of doing things and having the world trade that we used to have Right, because he believes in the globalist world order, and he's paid for by the globalist world order. Um, oh, there's there's no doubt about that at all. Uh, Biden wants to do what Biden wants to undo what Trump did, and that's making us competitive when it comes to countries like China. Well, not just not Biden just competitive, wants, not just competitive, but more along the lines of like how we're just in general said, fuck those countries. We're not going to protect their trade anymore. And Joe Biden's like, yo, well, we're, we're going to stand here and defend everybody's fucking trade routes and do all that type of shit. You know what I'm saying? Oh, more specifically, Biden wants us to continue to consume from China while at the same time protecting the trade routes that you know, China uses to sell us their shit. It, yeah. That's what Biden wants. It's no different than the Clinton administration, the Bush administration, the Obama administration. The Reagan he wants administration. To go back to, yeah, he, he wants to go back to the way things were before Trump came in and said, no, fuck you. Whatever you can produce in China, we can produce here. We're going to be, we're going to be competitive. He wants us to go back to being a consumer-based economy, not a producer-based economy. 
That's the difference. You know, when people hear when people hear about Obama talking about a magic wand, this is what they're talking about. It you there is such a thing as a magic wand that can put our GDP up to where Trump had it prior to the whole COVID thing. It's called being economically competitive on a global scale, something that China had a oh. chokehold on for three decades. Well, here's here's the thing, right? Legit. And this is, you know, I mean, this is the issue that, you know, I mean, I run into on a regular basis with this mentality. Um, we're not going to be economically viable and like economically competitive with the rest of these fucking countries. Like, we're just not going to do it. Right. Because America doesn't have the ability to do so. We don't have poor people like that to be able to, you know, I mean, build this type of shit. And we don't allow our real estate and property values to drop low enough that we can have individuals who can work for low enough wages that they can afford to live and continue to work for those wages. Right. Without having, you know, I mean, unionization and factories blow up. Right. So that's not going to happen in America. But with china and the whole fucking ideology with china and shit like this is what i keep telling motherfuckers is look you have to understand that you know like all this fucking black lives matter and antifa and all this bullshit they're all being paid for by nike and goddamn fucking uh you know fucking dewalt and fucking all these other companies who are standing here, you know, I mean, pissed off about the fact that Trump, you know, I mean, basically put a fucking turd in the punch bowl and said, yeah, you motherfuckers ain't drinking the Kool-Aid no more. You know, I mean, you're not getting this shit for free. We're not going to continue to fucking allow you to fuck over the American worker while at the same time, you know, I mean, fucking asking us to goddamn pay for it. You know, what I mean, and that's really what Trump did. And that's what Joe Biden wants to get rid of, because that's who paid for his fucking campaign. Well, and and that's the thing. It's not like we're going to make the American worker competitive to the Chinese worker because, to be blunt, we have standards that China doesn't. It's two completely different countries. We're not going to make ourselves competitive on a cost basis level. What we can do, however, is we can make America viable as an economic competitor by not being reliant upon countries like China or Vietnam or Turkey. Or South Korea, we can produce the same the same things that they produce, albeit at a higher cost, but in such a way that we we aren't reliant on those countries. It, even if it is, you know, core components are produced over there, but the final assembly takes place in the United States. It's the same thing that we did with the. Uh, well, they're going they they're automating is what they're doing. They're bringing a the fucking like for instance in India where like you know we lost all those t-shirt manufacturers to fucking covid. They just brought the factories back here and automated them because it's cheaper. Right? And so now you have two people working in that fucking factory. You know, I mean like you know I mean just making sure the machines run and the fucking shipping and paperwork is done. And you know I mean like the whole factory's like right here. You know what I mean? But anyway, yo, look, we got to keep going fucking like, man, listen, we just wasted like fucking 30 minutes talking about this dumb shit. <laughs> Let's keep going. <laughs> ah, all right. Thank me you and you. It's me and you. I know. Now, what we've got here is a color coded map showing the relation in terms of numbers between young people and old people. So the ratio of people aged 15 and under to those who are aged 65 and older. So youth versus retirees. If you're in blue, you have more youth. If you are in orange or red, you have more retirees. Now, as you can see, the United States has no orange or red. Those are the places where the old really, really, really heavily outnumber the youth. Uh, but the older states are the ones you would expect. Florida, of course, is a half retirement community. Maine, same thing for people from New York. West Virginia is a place where the youth try to get out relatively soon. It's about what you would expect. So remember, yellow, is as bad as it gets in the United States. Here's the EU. The exception of Ireland, yellow is as good as it gets in Europe. What this means is the European Union has aged out of any hope of demographic recovery, of ever being consumption led again. It is now an export union. And an export union cannot survive in the world we are going to without easy access to consumption-based systems. A trade war between the United States and Europe was coming regardless of who won the American elections. And since the EU is vulnerable on issues of market access, and since the biggest line item in the European Union budget is their agricultural subsidy program, 
this is going to end horribly for Europe and doubly so for European agriculture. What we've got here is percentage of total global dairy exports. Now the Kiwis down in the corner there, they're the number one players, we've talked about them already. Pretty much everybody else that you care about is in Europe. A few things to take in here. Uh, first, the United Kingdom. UK dairy is awful and it simply cannot compete with American dairy, even with subsidies. Second, Germany, the Netherlands, Denmark, Poland. These countries are only significant players in European, much less global dairy, because of common agricultural policy, uh, because of the subsidies that come from Brussels. What they've done is they've absorbed the subsidies in order to build out their facilities bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger, and then just dump it on the global market. You remove the common European subsidy system, and a lot of these producers simply vanish. Third, France and Belgium, collectively responsible for about 10% of the global export flow, they can compete, not because of bulk, but because of quality and variety. But what they're going to have is a problem reaching most customers. So these three markets are ones where they can continue to export. They're not going to face security concerns reaching them. Canada, of course, has the Quebec connection. Both Morocco and Algeria are former French colonies, and they're adjacent. So you can continue to see French and Belgian dairy playing in these markets moving forward. But these are the markets that the Europeans are going to lose. You know, that's, that, that's a lot. But... If the U.S. decides it wants to try to push into these markets to displace the Europeans, they will come up in every single case against the New Zealanders. So unless American dairy can find a way to compete with the Kiwis, more delivery options, more variety, more value add, the Kiwis are going to gobble up the majority of what becomes available. Now, as you know, dairy is not a one product thing. Uh, it's a very, this is a very, very, very broad view. And what is true for liquid is not true for butter, much less powder. So, for example, 11% of the United Kingdom's dairy market is sent to the European Union. That's going to evaporate on January 1. Think about what would happen if overnight you guys faced an 11% oversupply in your home market. Prices would probably tank by almost half. There's going to be a lot of similar churn throughout the industry on the global level, regardless of the general outlines of the world to come, because you can't adjust output and flows overnight. But access points will be changed overnight. Okay, I wanna close with some really good news and it regards your single largest current market, and that's Mexico. And to really understand Mexico, we need to look at another Latin American country first. Now, this is total export flows from Brazil to the world. The left half of this shows products by type, whether it's soybeans or televisions or medicines. The right half shows where they go, China, the United States, and so on. Now, if you are a developing country, what you really want is for these four colors, the maroons, the grays, the blues, to be big. These are the value-added components. This is manufacturing for the most part. This is where you develop skill sets, you increase your educational system, you build your value added. This is what you want. Brazil doesn't have much of that. Uh, Brazil is a very typical Latin American economy. It's heavy on commodities and it's heavy on exports to China. So this is normal, but not necessarily what you want. And here's Mexico. Very different, lots of blues. About two thirds of Mexico's exports are value added manufacturing. About three quarters of that goes to the United States, making Mexico the standout exception to everyone else in the Western Hemisphere. So, Mexico is an outlier, but not just an outlier in Latin America, but throughout the entire developing world. Because of this footprint, because of this structure, Mexico is actually more economically and technologically advanced than not just the rest of the developing world, but the entirety of Central Europe. In fact, it's a bigger economy than the entirety of Central Europe. And it's getting bigger and better. The Mexicans are aggressively expanding their industrial footprint and moving up the value-added scale. 
in league with Texas. They already dominate in automotive. They're heavy into aerospace support, or at least they were until COVID. And as Asian supply chains break down for reasons of health and national security and populism, Mexico is getting into the electronics business and computer assembly. It's growing, 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 growing. And everything that is bad for the broader international system is actually really good for Mexico because they already have a trade deal with the United States and they are right next door. Bigger, more money, more consumption. Oh, and one other thing, their agriculture is awful. Mountain agriculture is hard. Desert agriculture is hard. Tropical agriculture is hard. And pretty much all agriculture in Mexico is two of the three. Production costs are very high, quality is very low, and quantity is just simply insufficient to meet Mexicans' needs. And the Mexicans know it. They don't fear it because they know American foods are right next door, high quality and reasonably priced. The Mexicans are hungry, they're upwardly mobile, they are now your largest consumer, and they will remain so for at least the remainder of our lives. And dairy is no exception to any of this. U.S. dairy produces about twice per cow at about half the cost of Mexican cows. Mexican butter is beyond awful. So Mexican dairies tend to export their butter fat to the United States for processing. But even here, even in this market that you guys own, there is a danger. The Kiwis are coming. New Zealand has already become. All right, before we get into the goddamn New Zealanders again, what do you think about what he said about Mexico? All right, no, he's no, he's one hundred percent correct. And I'm I'm gonna break this down for people listening to this into the simplest terms I possibly can. It, and this is very basic supply demand, limited resource, you know, basic economics that people should understand. It shouldn't be difficult. So let, let's frame it like this. If you're playing a strategy game and it's too expensive for you to produce, you know, food, whether whether it's uh, raising cows to produce either beef or dairy or you know, tilling the fields to make grain, uh, if that's going to cost you too much, but your your ally to the north of you can do it at half the cost. What what are you going to do with that land? Well, shit. Uh, labor costs are low. Let's let's produce like let's say it's not all the microchips you need, but it's the microchips you need that go into making an iPhone or an Android phone or an HP laptop, something like that. We can produce that basic level bullshit income. You don't need a you don't need a high level of education to do it. If we can buy the raw materials for it. It's not going to take that much money. And we buy that. We build the factories. We build that cheap shit for you. Yeah, where it would cost you twice as much to build on your land. And we sell it to you. And instead, you sell us food. And we have a mutually beneficial trade agreement where we build microchips and, you know, the coverings that go over your touchscreen phones or laptops. And in exchange, you sell us cheese, dairy. You know, grain, that's the type of trade relationship the United States has with Mexico. It, and it's not even just advanced things like that. It could just be parts that go into fixing your 1980s Honda Civic. It, that's the trade relationship we have with Mexico. It's not the same with Canada. Canada, leave that one out. Canada's completely different. But when it comes to the United States, Canada, Mexico, Canada, Canada, insane. Canada doesn't have any kids and it's all it's an old folks home. So like there's no youth. Right. So like they're very high up the value added chain. They're literally competitors with America instead of being strategic trade partners. Um, it's not even that they're uh, they're high up on the value added chain. It's the fact that Canada can't produce anything that Mexico could at a competitive price. Well, no, no, and no, no. They're, they're, okay, so like, all right, here's, here's how this works, right? So Americans invent iPhones. We invent airplanes. We invent aerospace technology. We invent, you know, I'm saying, uh, fucking television technology. We invent, uh, you know, video system technology. We invent fucking new tools. We invent whatever, right? New type of cars, new fucking transportation methods. And what we do is the Mexicans build it. 
right? But on the same point, Canada does the same thing the United States does. They invent new fucking, you know what I mean, uh, fucking cars or new fucking, yeah, new car, new car technologies, new fucking engineering technologies, new fucking uh, machinery technologies. Literally, they're competing with the United States. At the, you know what I mean, on the same level as the United States is. But the problem is, is that they're very expensive due to the fact that they have um, they have a massive amount of old people and no young people to pay for them. So their taxes and social problems are extremely high cost. And that's really the problem with Canada that and they don't grow any fucking food because, you know, it's fucking it's tundra. You know what I mean, it's extremely cold in Canada. And on top of that, you know, I mean, they've outlawed every form of fucking energy. So they have to import everything from the United States or not use it at all. Oh, and that, that goes back into the point in video one where they don't, because of their birth rate and because of their cost of living, it, they're, not, they're not a viable competitor. It, even if they, are, if, if they do try to be competitive, it's just more expensive for them to do well, so. Well, I'm not, I'm not saying, I'm not saying they, they're, like, com, they're competitive as far as, you know what I mean, uh, like wages and shit or like as far as like trade's concerned. But they're a competitor in the way in what they do as a country because of where they are in the value added chain. You understand oh, no, what I'm I, no, I get what, yeah, no, I get what you're saying. I'm just saying the, the way that they're, the way that their structure is set up, they just, they aren't, they aren't viable as a competitor simply because they don't have the actual capability of being competitive. But they're, they're still stuck trying to compete with the United States and also China. They find themselves in a very bad position. So Canada's not a threat. They're, I, I don't know what Canada's doing. Canada's doing some weird, some, some weird Fuck stuff, but <laughs> we're not gonna we're not gonna go into the top hat. <laughs> All right, let's 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 keep going. Let's keep going. All right. Even in this market that you guys own, there is a danger. The Kiwis are coming. New Zealand has already become Mexico's top source of imported butter, which should not be happening, and their footprint is expanding. Okay, that's a lot for an hour. Hope you guys process all that. Uh, we've got plenty of time for questions. Uh, if you're looking for a little light reading, there are the books. Uh, but more importantly, uh, the, you can follow me on Twitter or sign up for the newsletter, which is free and will always be free. Just sign up at zion.com slash newsletter. Okay, uh, I am ready for questions. Do we have a few? Peter, thank you. Uh, we do have a few questions coming in through the app. Uh, that's where we encourage viewers and, and audience members to submit their questions. Um, and thanks for talking about aging trends. That gives me permission to put on my glasses so I can actually read the questions. Um, let's start with this. The dairy industry Mine are right here. <laughs> the, the dairy industry in Vietnam has grown significantly in the last 20 years. What's your take on Vietnam and their neighboring countries regarding their ability to support dairy production and consumption? Uh, Southeast Asia in general has kind of a local ecosystem for manufacturing and energy processing and supply that is, it's pretty good, uh, especially in the world where we're going to where transcontinental and transoceanic shipping are going to be a lot more constrained. So it's actually one of the parts of the world that I'm pretty bullish on moving forward. And it's a part of the world that is likely to have significant military and economic partnerships with Australia, New Zealand, and the United States. Um, that said, uh, Vietnam has 140 million people. Uh, they're probably gonna have 180 million by 2050. Uh, they can't possibly keep up and they face many of the same challenges that the Mexicans have. It's, it's rugged terrain, it's tropical, it's not great for animal agriculture. It's not really great for any sort of row crop agriculture in general. So the capacity of the Southeast Asians to keep up in any sort of animal husbandry industry is not just suspect, it's hilarious to consider. Uh, that said, as they adopt a slightly more Western diet. All right. I don't, I don't really think you want to, like, we want to like stand here and really get into the specifics of dairy farming, to be perfectly honest with you. <laughs> yeah. I mean, uh, the Q and a might be interesting, but I don't know if it's enough for us to uh, go into great detail about it. 
that's kind of where I'm at. You know what I mean? So I figured, you know what I mean? Like, yo, what do you think of Peter Zeehan, my brother? Fucking like, yo, I'm a huge fan of his fucking work. You know what I mean? No, I, I like his approach because he, he doesn't go into the deep politics of like this person's doing this or this person is doing that. Like he's, he's grounded in, in his assessment. And granted that being said, his assessment is very much based on all of the global trends, all of, all of his, uh, his assertions are predicated on the fact that the trends have to continue as perceived without outside influence. And I, I've said this before to many people who've asked me for investing advice. It, everything is fine as long as you're following, following a trend until an outside factor changes that trend. And his, assum- his assumptions and his, well, his presumptions are no different. And they will be susceptible to that same thing. They're, you're never going to you're never going to be able to remove that factor when it comes to viewing how the global economic trends might change or how they might progress at some point in time in the future, especially with the degree that he's trying to predict them. Something could happen that changes the entire structure, the entire dynamic of how these how these economies and how these structures actually work and interact with each other. But that being said, his, his breakdown is pretty spot on. Well, you know, the, the, the purpose of geopolitics, right, which is what he does. He's a geopolitical strategist. And what he does is he go and companies come to him and go, all right, well, you know, we want to invest in this country. And he goes, all right, well, you know, Here's the political structure. Here's the geography. Here's where the transportation is. Here's the logistics. This is what you can do. This is what the problems you're going to run into as far as people are concerned and things of this nature, right? And ultimately, though, geography really dictates what you're going to be as a country, right? I mean, because, like, you know, you're, you're not going to have Iran ever be a massive agricultural exporter, right? Because Iran is a very mountainous country. Like, it is what it is. It's very hard to grow things. You know, and on top of that, if you have a country like Iran that's very, very mountainous where their population lives, it's not going to be a very trusting country because individual, it's not going to be a very friendly country in general because mountain people tend to be kind of hardened. You know I mean? Like, us Appalachians are, you know I mean, kind of hardened individuals, you know, like, get the fuck off my property type of people. No matter where you go, it's always the same way. Same with the Afghanis. You know I mean? They're always warriors, that type of shit. Um, but they're never individuals who are highly innovative. You know I mean? Like, and individuals who live in cities along the coast are going to end up being, you know I mean, uh, more open to new cultures because they experience them more often because of individuals coming into port on a regular basis and bringing in new foods. You're going to understand what sushi tastes like and things of this nature. So, like, geography really does dictate who you're going to be as a nation. <clears throat> and if you add, you know, I mean, geography to politics to, you know, I mean, um, what's the word I'm looking for here? You add geography to politics and then you add in infrastructure and the world as a whole and look at it macroly, you know, I mean, in a macro way, you know, like not like macro, like the fish, but, you know, look at it in a macro level, like you really can start, you know, I mean, looking at trends in a different manner and how things really operate. And, you know, I mean, understand, like, you know, like the trajectory of where things are heading, the trajectories of where things were and the trajectory of where things are right now. And that's, you know, I mean, that's really what he does as a whole. So his breakdowns are based on like math and science and, you know, I mean, like fucking, you know, actual observable reality rather than, you know, I mean, this dumb shit of, you know, I mean, going, oh, you know, what the fuck is Boris? You know, I mean, what is fucking, you know, fucking Boris, whatever the fuck his name is in England, or Vladimir Putin, or fucking Xi Jinping, or whatever the case might be, you don't have to worry about them, because ultimately, you go, well, you know, I mean, this is where we are, these are the demographics, you know, I mean, and, like, this is where it has to head, because there's no fucking choice. Um, That's where his breakdowns are actually really good, and even though it might, 
in the short term, you know, when it comes to people like me that do trading, we we look at things much more in the short term, where you know, something might result in a two uh, percent move up or two percent move down, but we look at things in the course of weeks, maybe months. Maybe. Michael, you you look at you look at the quarter. You know what I'm saying? Where he's looking at the decade. Because like he's and, saying, because his, his point is he's looking at an individual who's going to build a factory. So they're not looking at the next quarter. They're looking at 10 years worth of fucking growth. Oh, exactly. And, and that's where that's where his uh, greatest strength comes when his uh, when he's doing his breakdowns is he's not looking at things like me uh, where. Again, where I look on, you know a day by day or a week by week or a month by month basis just to see where things are going to move in a percent or 2%, maybe sometimes five if I'm really lucky. But he's looking on, or he's looking at things in the sense of this is the larger long-term uh, macroeconomic trend where it doesn't matter if it's this person or this person that's in power, you're not going to create more fertile land. A, this is the way that the, this economy survives and in this instance as we've gone through in the uh, past two videos yeah the the kiwis have an advantageous degree is it going to make you money in six months to a year probably not but do you want to invest in it now because they're going to be competitive uh two three four five years down the road and make you a lot of money in that sense Yes, and his breakdown is very good in that in that aspect because he's not focusing on, well, Trump is going to win or Biden is going to win or, you know, this population is going to expand uh, in two, three years. There's going to be a population boom. No, he's looking at the long term macroeconomic trends and what's going to be viable as a as a long term investment. It. It's not going to make you money overnight. It's not going to make you rich overnight, but it's going to let you know who are going to be the strong players two, three, four, a decade from now. Because, again, you can't just create new pastures or fields that are, are going to make New Zealand you know, the largest producer compared to the United States. But give of, them of five dairy years, products, you know and they're I mean? going to be competitive. Yeah, I mean they're already they already like it's a percentage of exports of the globe. You know, what I mean, like legit, they still export more than the United States does, right? Which you know, what I mean, because you know, like, and that's really only about the fact that the first world nations right now have a choice as to what they're fucking bringing in. You know what I mean? And you know, once they're no longer viable and they no longer have the option, you know, I mean, of the shit that they're getting now, you know, I mean, they're going to have to bring in, you know, I mean, shit from the U S because the U S is going to force them to do so. But anyway, yo, look, man, I like, I want to end this motherfucking shit and I gotta get these motherfuckers uploaded to YouTube. You know what I mean? I'm gonna fucking send you a link. Um, you got anything to chill out, my brother? No, man, I'm just happy that we had a chance to do this because, you know me, I like economics and I think his breakdown was great. If you're looking for a long term investment at a bare minimum, listen to this guy, give it some thought. His points are solid. I <laughs> yeah, I can only I can only nitpick, but I'll everything he said is on point. That's where I'm at. That's why I like this dude. You know what I mean? You should read that. You should read his books. You know what I'm saying? They're fucking amazing. Legit. You know what I mean? Like fucking, I, I might send you, uh, I don't know if you like listen to audio books or anything like that, but I can probably send you some fucking audio books from, you'll fucking thoroughly enjoy them. Oh, dude, I don't discount it. Cause again, like I said, short term, it, there's definitely volatility, but long term, I, I think he's predicting the, the long-term trends pretty damn well. That's where I'm at. So, in the meantime, man, yo, look, we're going to shut this bitch off. You'll know the deal. Like, share, and subscribe. Make sure you join the Discord. Link is in the description. You know what I'm saying? You get notified of all the new videos that I drop on a regular basis. <clears throat> and, I mean, if y'all enjoyed our breakdown, you know what I mean? Like, yo, come back for more. You know the situation. We'll do more like this. Every once in a while, we're going to do a crazy-ass stream where, you know, we talk about, you know what I mean, some some retarded internet nonsense but you know i gotta have fun you know what i mean like <laughs> shit i gotta be able to enjoy what i do sometimes they can't always be so fucking serious like all right yo man i'm out peace